here I am. Hello, everybody. I know what I was going to do. I know exactly what I was going to do. I was going to go fix my hair. I'm literally going to do that. I'm literally going to do that. I'm going to be right back. Okay, I'm back. A million percent better. I don't even know how we can have a million percent, but it's a million percent better. <laughs> so glad I left to do that. Okay, we're here. This is Dr. Annette Fairovich. Guess who I am? I am the teacher. You are here in the classroom. Thanks for coming. This is the Bookless Classroom. And we have been focusing a lot only so far on history and more specifically, U.S. history. And guess what? I love it. We're going to be doing some other things in the early bird classroom. I have to figure out how I'm going to be getting other lessons in. I'd hope that, you know, the government would have picked me up, said, you are the teacher, Annette. Here's your awesome pay, because we don't pay teachers enough, so we're going to let you know we're going to pay you a lot, Annette, and uh, especially, yeah, because you're a doctor, Annette, and uh, yeah, and then I would have a classroom full of students, and that's kind of what I was hoping, but so far, hasn't happened. I'm still working on wardrobe, so whatever. Oh, why do I have the story of Moses still up there? That wasn't supposed to be it. So... I have been working really hard to get to you. And I started to say, so I'm trying to figure out how to get some other lessons here, but we've got a long way to go. And we've got in U.S. history. I mean, you know, we're only on president number three, but we've got a lot of information that we've been giving you. And I'm so excited about this president, Thomas Jefferson. So it's kind of funny how you walk into like discovering what the president is all about, right? And I'm trying to think, do I have a bad attitude towards Thomas Jefferson or do I have a good attitude towards Thomas Jefferson? And so, you know, I know Thomas Jefferson is a, um, you know, very popular president, right? Because he wrote the Declaration of Independence. So he's a very popular president. And I know that, but I didn't, you know, but I don't know a lot about him. And after I read George Washington, I liked George Washington so much that I started thinking, I don't know if I'm going to like Thomas Jefferson as much. George Washington was more or less a Federalist, and so was John Adams, and so was Alexander Hamilton. Now, these Federalists are people who believe in a strong federal government. The Republicans, who, then, oh, were, who were also known at this time as the Democratic Republicans and later became the Democrats. So I think that's the reason why they confused everybody, to make sure that later on down the road you weren't confused with their ideology. Because Thomas Jefferson, based on politics today, is probably more Democratic-leaning than Republican-leaning. So the titles of the day... The titles of this day, of this time, don't fit the Democrat and Republican titles of today. All right. So you can't, you have to listen to what they said to understand what they stood for. Why do I say that Thomas Jefferson likely was more of a Democrat today than a Republican? Because Thomas Jefferson very much stood for religious freedom and had no room for religious intolerance. So much so that he was, um, during the campaign, he was smeared, right? So, so same thing way back then. He was being smeared by his opponents as being a, um, as being the Antichrist. I got that from... So, just in the same way, labeling people, right, in exactly the same way, I got that from uh, 
The History of the American Presidency by John Bowman. Now, that not that interesting that somebody would ever label Thomas Jefferson as the Antichrist, right? So really interesting stuff, but so why would they? Why would they take such a strong label to Thomas Jefferson? Well, the reason why is because he was so against religious intolerance. So people who were very, very religious looked at him as a force being against religion and, you know, and the right to have your own religious freedoms. He was for the Bill of Rights, that anyone could practice their religion. But because he was so, at the time, liberal, that's such a liberal thought. Liberal means freedom. It's a liberal thought. Everyone should practice whatever religion they want to. They should be free to practice whatever religion they want to. That is a liberal thought. And so it would it would be closer to, well, it doesn't matter. It would be closer to the Democrats today because Democrats are considered liberal. Thomas Jefferson was, was speaking, espousing, voicing a very liberal thought. Anyone should practice any religion. And, of course, religious people are like, no, my religion is the right religion, and you're going to hell for thinking that any religion is okay. And that's exactly what was happening to Thomas Jefferson. So, and then, more so, it was happening because of the same arguments that we're having now. Not the Antichrist. The Antichrist thing is a religious thing, right? But so much debate and hardship. And Thomas Jefferson, it seems to me, took these decisions and choices that he made because he was such a humanitarian, he cared about people. No matter what they believed, no matter what their class was, how much money they made, he believed in human rights. Now, he also owned more slaves than almost any other president, and maybe any other president. But what the impression I got and this is, this is what you pick up from reading a lot of background, right? And then his own words. And then his own words. So I found his inaugural speech. Right? So I found his inaugural speech and the speech is here. So I didn't look it up in this one. But what I found out in this one, the 501 best known speeches, is that they don't... They don't really, it's all more about, look at this, it's more about pictures than it is about anything else. But I might actually go and look at the, look at his uh, speech because, um, oh my gosh, this is a good book though. They have ancient history speeches in here. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. Who's that? They have speeches by anonymous people. Who's that? Who's anonymous? Let's see. They have two of them in here by Thomas Jefferson. And they say that he really was not a real great orator. Yeah, so, so they do have his inaugural speech here and then they also have but it is only part of it and I highlighted the speech that I liked so let's see here Thomas Jefferson Oh, gosh, this is a good speech, too. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for me, for one people, to dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate 
an equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. This is Jefferson's speech about the Declaration of Independence. I'm going to keep going. We hold these truths to be self-evident. I don't know why sometimes... I don't ever do this when I'm not on camera. I don't ever do this. I could read these things day and night. And then all of a sudden I read them out loud and it just strikes me. And, and why wouldn't it? Why shouldn't it? These are the words of our founding fathers who were brilliant in taking us to a place where we were able to be independent. And, and when we read our book about where, um, who is responsible for democracy, let me get the book without knocking a million things over. Who really created democracy, right? There was only one other democracy before the United States. So when somebody stands up there and says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, to the people, when any form of government becomes destructive to the people, it is a right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. Government should not be changed for light or transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Have you become accustomed to evilness? And should you be abolishing it? I'm not saying abolish the government. This is the Declaration of Independence is, is what this is. And what does it need? It needs prudence is what he said. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable. We are more disposed to suffer when evils are around us to be suffering, is what he's saying, than to right themselves. So mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms which they are accustomed. We don't, we don't abolish them so readily. But when a long train of abuses and us, usurpations, to usurp, to move aside, to step aside, to push something aside, usurp, to overstep it. Usurp, you usurpations usurpations i'm not used to that form of that word pursuing invariably invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism it is their right it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards 
for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of those colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. My gosh. And so then he goes on to list all of the things that they are saying were abuses of power by King George III was the king. So that was that was part of Jefferson that was Jefferson's speech, which I did not read until just now. The speech regarding why the Declaration of Independence. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Do not let anyone ever tell you that they're gonna take and change text for our history. You take that person and you kick them out of their public office. I'm sorry, Ron DeSantis. I like you better than the former president. I do. I don't know why. I haven't quite come up with a good reason other than, again, kind of the lesser of two evils, just like you guys did with Trump and Hillary. But you cannot be telling us that somehow you have got some authority or you're going to get a group of people with authority to tell us we're going to get rid of these books. I don't even know. What is this? What is this? Is this like 1850s? Is this a witch hunt? What is the matter with you? And I'm going to say it again because I want an answer. When you are telling that you're going to remove history books or change history to make us look more patriotic, here's my question to you. What is the matter with you? What's the matter with you? Like, what's the matter with you? That's what I want to know. What is the matter with you? Tell me, what's the matter with you? Because there's a problem. I want to know the matter. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and put up my Thomas Jefferson slides over here that I have for you. Oh, what happened? <laughs> Camera change. That's the most sophisticated looking thing I've got going on. It looks like I have another camera. <laughs> I do not. I have camera guys. That's what I've got going. Okay, so there is our, let me see if I, what I've got before that. Don't forget what I put out yesterday for you guys. So, uh, what I gave you yesterday was um, a bunch of worksheets. How many? No way. Seven. Seven worksheets I gave you. So name the 13 colonies. Um, fill in the blanks. So some facts about the Revolutionary War. All of this is about the Revolutionary War. Information that we've already covered. Match up the term with the definition. Match up the person with a description, and then this is a questionnaire that you've got. So, 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 you know, who was the king during the time of the American Revolution that was doing all the taxing? Those kinds of questions. And then, and then the last two um, uh, worksheets that I have there for you is if you are interested in the battles, four battles that I have there of the uh, Revolutionary War. So if you're at all interested in, let's see here. All right, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna worry about it so much. All right, so I, I can't see is what the problem is. I can't see what those are, and so I'm I'm looking to open it up, and and uh, I'm not gonna worry about it because it's gonna take too much time. I can read them. Battle of Bunker Hill, 
Battle of Saratoga. And so you've got the date, the location, the leaders. What does that say? The cause and the outcome of the war. All right. So you can take a look at those. They're kind of, it's kind of cool. So the Battle of Bunker, Bunker Hill, the Battle of Saratoga, and then we've got the Battle of Cowpens and the Battle of Yorktown. Yorktown. All right, so, so those were some worksheets I gave. You can always make sure that you email me if you want to. So if you, if you um, really want those worksheets and you want a hard copy of those worksheets, you can always email me. There's my email address, Dr. Dr. Period. Farovich, F as in Frank, E-R-A-V as in Victor, I-C-H, at healthymindbodyspirit.net. Get those worksheets. They really will help you especially if you are at all interested in history. I know my son was a history buff. I was not, as you can tell, I was not. That's the reason why I'm teaching it to you now, because I am now. Now I love this stuff, and I want to get to ancient history, but I'm even worse on ancient, ancient history than I am on American history. So you guys are just taking a long walk with me, finding out who right now our third president was. All right, so we got a we got a little bit of his Declaration of Independence speech, and I'm not got emotional about that. What the heck? Oh my gosh! I think I need some vitamin D or something. I don't know. Vitamin B is probably what it is. Probably more vitamin B. No, it's not. It's because I'm a humanitarian, just like Thomas Jefferson was. He cared about people a lot. So I started saying, I didn't know what I thought about him, right? Because he was a Republican and a Republican in a way that he was for states' rights. And I like George Washington so much that I became like kind of a federal rights person. And then after I read the, um, the book here again about our democracy, right? Who created democracy? Which I read on Tuesday, this past Tuesday. So day 30, one day 31 i read this on day 31 so come to 31 in the bookless classroom and you'll find out but um i'm, I'm like how was what was i saying about thomas jefferson over here about what a humanitarian he was and what a believer he was in equal rights. So, so again, I started saying about, but he owned so many slaves. That's what I started saying. And so how can this humanitarian who truly believed in equal rights for everybody own so many slaves? And after reading all that I read, my, my conclusion was that he was taking care of those people. That's what he was doing. He inherited many of those slaves as I said yesterday, when his father-in-law died. So Randolph was the last name of a very elite family, apparently. That was his wife's maiden name, Martha Randolph. And when her father died, Thomas Jefferson inherited all of their slaves. Well, as I said, you could choose to be a master who was unfair, right? And, and, um, was just a tyrant, but it, and so that's what I wondered about Thomas Jefferson. I wondered if he was kind of a hypocrite, if if he had all these slaves, but then was like blah 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 about you know freedom and Declaration of Independence and all these kinds of things. But no, what I think in the end is the reason why he had so many slaves, in my guesstimation, was because he was taking care of them. That's that's what it seemed to me. Let's read from our first book of biographies what, what, what we've got here, what they have to say about Thomas Jefferson. Okay, so there we have not the best picture of Jefferson, but a nice watercolor painting. I love the art. I love looking at the different art is what I absolutely love. So this is a watercolor, you can tell, right? So you can see it's got, um, you know, there's pen and ink there with the black. But then you can see it's watercolor because it's just like as if you, you take water and you can see how the how it it just kind of blends there. 
Right. So there's a beautiful watercolor there. Get the page over there, Annette. Dr. Annette, to you. Thomas Jefferson, 1743 to 1826. How he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Born in Virginia, by the way, um, the first five presidents were all born in Virginia except for John Adams. John Adams was born in Massachusetts. So kind of interesting. I, f I didn't find it that interesting at first, but some for I, I know every time I say I read where they were born, I'm like, yeah, but Adams was born in Massachusetts. Born in Virginia, Thomas Jefferson was the son of a well-to-do plantation owner. When his father died, Thomas was only 14. As the oldest boy, he became the owner of the plantation, which his guardian took care of for him. I didn't know that. Every one of these books that I read and get the information out of gives me, gives me a different piece of information. I did not know that. At the age of 16, Thomas Jefferson went to college. Then, like Gandhi and Lincoln, he became a lawyer. In 1776, America was getting ready to fight the Revolutionary War to gain freedom from England. At the time, Americans were ruled by England, also called Great Britain. Americans needed a, settle, a, a statement to explain to England why they now wanted to run their own country. Benjamin Franklin and others contributed ideas for the Declaration, but the strong and beautiful words were Thomas Jefferson's. We hold these truths to be self-evident, he wrote, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we've heard those words. I guess I never put the two together, that they are the words in the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson spoke to declare their independence. And it was more than just a speech. It was a document that they paid taxes on and that they delivered to England. Very beautiful. America won the Revolutionary War and became the United States of America. George Washington was elected to, the first, to be the first president. John Adams was the second and Thomas Jefferson was the third. But Thomas Jefferson was more than a leader and lawmaker. He designed his Virginia home called Monticello, Monticello. He invented a lap desk and a plow. He played violin while his wife Martha played the harpsichord. The harpsichord is similar to an organ from what I understand. He also grew beautiful flowers, herbs, and vegetables in huge gardens at Monticello. Jefferson owned many slaves, yet he thought slavery was cruel. He wanted to write something against the practice of slavery in the Declaration of Independence, but was outvoted. As an educator, like me, Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia. Now, people in Virginia knew that. People in particular at the University of Virginia probably knew that, but I did not know that. Did you? Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia by Thomas Jefferson. What? How awesome. I would go there now. I would go there now just because Thomas Jefferson went there. Not there. He didn't go there. What am I talking about? Just because Thomas Jefferson founded it. Thomas Jefferson went to... I don't know, do they say where he went to school? He became a lawyer. Oh, yes. College of Mary and, you know, two first names, something like that. That's the one he went to. It's in, it's in one of these over here. I'll get it. As an educator, Thomas Jefferson founded the University of Virginia. He also designed some of the loveliest buildings. Jefferson's picture is on the nickel. When you turn the nickel over, you will see Monticello! I didn't know that. Holy moly. What am I doing? I'm getting a nickel. I didn't even put that on my interesting facts. I totally forgot about it. Did you know that? Oh my gosh. So there we have it. There is Thomas Jefferson on the nickel. That's like a new picture of him, isn't it? I, it looks like. And whoop, flip it over. 
Monticello. I didn't know that. Oh my gosh. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Who doesn't love being a teacher? I don't know. Everybody should love being a teacher because look at what we learn. I'm looking to see if I have a different kind of nickel in here. To see if there's, because that picture seemed a little different to me. There we got Washington on the quarter and the dollar, the most used, and Benjamin Franklin on the what? Franklin got the $100 bill is what he got. Yeah, that's a that's a newer picture of Thomas Jefferson. Now I'm reading, or now I'm remembering the older nickels. How do I have a... I have, honestly, a purse. Look at this. Change is busting out of that change purse. And one nickel? One nickel? That's it? Yeah. There might be another one. Or it's probably... Oh, there we go. It's a different one. There we go. That's what I'm used to seeing. That's a Thomas Jefferson I'm used to seeing on there. And like I said, I totally forgot as I was doing all of this. And he's also on Mount Rushmore as well, which I think is so overlooked, right? Like we talk about the presidents and we're like, oh, Washington's on Mount Rushmore. Oh, Jefferson's on Mount Rushmore. That's a, first of all, you know, you, you look like you're this tiny when you're standing on the face of one of those people and, and you're making a face out of dynamite and stone. And then there's Monticello on the back. There we go. So this is the this is the nickel I'm used to. There was a new picture of, of um, who are we talking about? Jefferson. Pretty cool. I think that's cool. Okay, so... That was my first book of biographies. Let's go over here and get up my. There we go. And let's take a look at this now. So he was a third president. He was president from 1801 to 1809. So as you can see, in case you didn't notice, we have got he had two terms and we can see that because there are eight years and so already here at the beginning we have got presidents who are who are four term four year one term presidents if you have eight years you are done so washington set the pres precedent for being president right he said four years for a term two terms and then you're out. You can see there, uh, Thomas Jefferson was a farmer, a lawyer, a family man, a diplomat, an architect, a linguist, a scientist, a philosopher, an inventor. He played the violin and he was the founder of the University of Virginia. And out of all those things, it's, it is said that um, he liked being a farmer the best. So that's why farmer is first. That, that's what he, and he didn't really care about being a politician, although he earned a living being a lawyer. He liked being a farmer the best. He earned a living being a lawyer. He didn't care about for being a politician. He didn't like it, but he needed to be because of his humanitarian kind of perspective. He drafted the Declaration of Independence. He's responsible for the Louisiana Purchase. Now, here is an interesting little tidbit about the Federalist Party and the Republican Party. The Republican Party, Thomas Jefferson, was part of the Republican Party. Washington, Adams, and Alexander Hamilton, they were considered Federalists. The problem, as we've said, is that when you have a strong state, they act as independent countries, but they don't have their army and they can't protect themselves. So when the federal government said, you need to obey this law, John Adams, Alien and Sedition Act, two of the states said, you don't have the authority to do that. And they said, we're not going to do it. We're, we're simply not going to do what you said. Imprison people, uh, violate their right to the freedom of speech, right? And uh, imprison immigrants. We're not doing it. So it doesn't apply to us. So all of a sudden you've got all these states acting independently. Now, 
Jefferson really was more for states acting independently. He was for that. But when he was president, he realized that he was going to have to make some really tough decisions. The Louisiana Purchase, not so tough right? That wasn't such a tough decision to make. We had more than doubled our size with that single purchase. And since we were such good allies with, friend, for, with France, Benjamin Franklin, a diplomat for France, Thomas Jefferson, a diplomat for France, John Adams, a diplomat for France, he jumped on it with executive authority. He made a presidential federal decision to purchase that land without a vote, without state delegates coming into the, to the whole thing. He had to do it quickly. He had to make an executive decision as the president, and he made that purchase. So in that way, Jefferson was violating his own um his own beliefs, his own values in states' rights by making that purchase. Now, nobody today, nobody ever thought that that purchase was a wrong purchase, but he believed if he had put it up for a vote or had it up for even debate that France would renege on their offer and they would lose all of that land. So Th Thomas Jefferson acted like that as an executive and as president, as head of the executive branch, as president. Now, there was also another decision that he made. That was similar in um, controversy similar in states versus federal rights to make those choices and similar in controversy. And what that was, was that he either had to go to war. So here, in 1801, Jefferson initiated the new nation's first major military operation by sending a naval squadron to put down the Barbary pilots in Triple, Tripoli. That's where those Barbary, the Barbary pirates. And now remember, California had Barbary Coast. That's, that's where I read it. I remember I said I read it someplace and then there was this connection. So Barbary Coast was given the name after the Barbary pirates here and barbarian kind of behavior. What were those pirates doing? Two years... I, I wanted to read their words instead of telling you what they were doing. And here they are. Far more vexing were the effects of the war between France and Britain, both of whom were preying on American shipping with Britain stealing American sailors on the high seas. Jefferson, believing in a weak government and executive branch, It says, Jefferson, believing in a weak government and executive branch, Jefferson, worked with Congress indirectly, persuading rather than decreeing. His first term was generally triumphant. So here what they're saying here is, is that he wouldn't decree. He would plead with them. He would try and convince them of his ideas of what to do about these British and French ships that have pirates that are stealing our American sailors and, and, and what taking the goods on the ship. What are they doing with them? What are they doing? Are they just killing them? Are they enslaving them? That's what I'm guessing that they're doing. So they're taking our sailors. So here now it says, okay, so, so, he had sent ministries to Napoleon to try and buy New Orleans from France. 
Instead, they found themselves being offered the whole Louisiana Territory. With Jefferson's blessing, the ministers made haste to cement the deal before Napoleon changed his mind. By taking that presidency, by taking that presidency was in, in a, why do we not have this commas where we need this? I'm finding that there are typos in here. By taking that, his presidency was in a quandary. Either he had to go to war, which he resisted, or to exceed his powers once again. He chose the latter, imposing embargo on all foreign experts in an effort to put economic pre pressure on the belligerents. So he is imposing a tax on exporting so that the pirates aren't going to be stealing our stuff. The results were disastrous. His action had no effect on England or France, but it devastated the American economy. With Jefferson's popularity in its nadir and the nation near rebellion, Congress repealed the controversial embargo at the end of his presidency. So Jefferson put a tax on exports, and he did that as, a, in, as an executive decision without votes or without debates. So Louisiana Purchase and an embargo. So what Jefferson is doing is going against his very own beliefs, values, and theories in states' rights as president by making executive de decisions that are not democratic. He made them himself. And one of them was good, Louisiana Purchase. The other one was bad. So you see now a president who has humanitarian values at heart is a very good president, it would appear. And yet he cannot stand completely by his own values and beliefs, whatever they are. As a federalist or as a statesman, he cannot stand by his own beliefs 100% of the time. And I just think that um, yeah, the story of him is just amazing. Let's look at some of the pictures, shall we? Here in this book, because they're amazing. So there is to the left, the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, had a distinguished background as an eloquent advocate of the natural rights of of men. And that just sort of says it that again, we have been endowed with unalienable rights, rights that you can't take away because they are the right of every human being. They are naturally born rights that every human being has. And we fight for it. Up at the top here is the signing of the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July, 1776, as seen in this portrait by J. Trumbull, Jefferson was responsible for the drafting of this influential document. And we've seen that picture before. By J. Trumbull. Left, that is what is sitting on the back of your nickel. Oh my gosh, look at, there it is. Monticello, the home of Thomas Jefferson. Look at how they gave their homes names. I think I'm gonna give my home a name as well. This is going, I don't know what it's gonna be yet. I can't, I can't do it. Above Alexander Hamilton, a Federalist, was often at odds with Jefferson. Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton's on what? The $5 bill, right? No, the 10. Lincoln's on the five. Duh. The 10. Did you know that? Did you say that? Did I hear you saying that? I didn't hear you say it. I don't know if you said it. Maybe you knew it. I don't know. I didn't hear you. To the right is the signing of the U.S. Constitution in 1787. Kind of looks like the Declaration of Independence, but it's not. Below, Jefferson departing for his inauguration in 1801. There's a pen and ink. That's a pen and ink right there. Awesome pictures, aren't they? Okay. All right, so I'm going to read this statement. So it is on the previous page. This painting by D.M. Carter shows Stephen de Couture 
boarding a Barbary pirate gunboat during the Tripolitan War. Hmm. So a scene of what the pirates have been doing to our ships during that Tripolitan War. So there's a deep dive. I don't know anything about it other than Tri means three. I don't know what Palatin is, although it's, you know, Cosmopolitan, so it's got something like that. I don't know, though. So so do a little bit of a, it, it's not a very deep dive. Let's do a shallow dive. Somebody do a shallow dive and put your comments on that down below, if you would. So what what is that commenting on? Stephen Decatur and the Tripolitan War. I don't know. Enough about it. Okay, so let's look at this. Let's get to something else here. He was a fierce, he was responsible for the Louisiana Purchase. We said he was a fierce supporter of states' rights, which I kind of explained to you and gave you some examples. He resigned as Washington's Secretary of State in 1793. So he started as Washington's Secretary of State. He was the vice president to John Adams. And if you remember, um, then, then he became president. John Adams was president for one term. Then Thomas Jefferson beat him. Handily is what he did. Uh, the person he had trouble beating was Aaron Burr. And what ended up happening was, was that this, they actually decided this through a judge who would end up being president. And Thomas Jefferson got to be president and Aaron Burr ended up getting um, tried. He went on trial for what? He was arrested on charges of conspiracy. Jefferson was uncharacter so so Jefferson was easily reelected to a second term in 1804, but already seeds of dissension had been sown. Despite his considerable popularity, Jefferson had been the victim of vicious personal attacks. His religious beliefs in particular in particular were liberal enough to have him branded antichrist by some New England con congressionalists. His vice president, Aaron Burr, had resigned and in 1806 was arrested on charges of conspiracy. Jefferson was uncharacteristically vindictive towards Burr. His efforts to influence Chief Justice John Marshall during Burr's trial only deepened the rift between himself and Marshall after Burr was acquitted. So there was a, there was a Supreme Court Chief Justice, John Marshall, who was deciding about charges of conspiracy to what was Thomas Jefferson's vice president. So Thomas Jefferson had two vice presidents, the first one being Aaron Burr until 1805. And then from 1805 to 1809 was George Clinton of New York. George Clinton related to the Clintons, because what we do know is that the same doggone names keep turning up everywhere, right? Kevin McCarthy, Joe McCarthy sound familiar to you, Kevin McCarthy? No wonder that last president has got you by the cojones, right? Because you can't claim communist, which is exactly what he is. He is, what, what was the documentary I just watched yesterday? It was on uh, Pluto, is what it was on. Yeah, pretty good documentary. Basically saying all those reporters were getting together to find out about, um, you know, bigger kinds of, uh, well, basically espionage and uh, money laundering, right? And high, high stakes criminal behavior. Faux show. Okay, so... Yeah, that was Aaron Burr. So, and uh, and his vice presidents. He was a VP for John Adams, but they were from two different parties. This is another thing that we want to be sort of that we want to learn. This is something else that we want to learn, and that is that the Constitution was never made for two parties. And so, President Number Two, we all of a sudden have most votes for president, 
Second most votes is vice president. And now we've got two people from two different parties. And so this is the last time that we had president, vice president. From now on, the president would pick his vice president. It would no longer be that the second most votes went to vice president. Why? Because the constitution didn't interpret or did not expect that we'd have two parties. And therefore now we've got the problem of a president and vice president being from two different parties and not being able to work together. This caused a great rift in the relationship between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, so much so that Adams left office without saying goodbye and was not at Thomas Jefferson's inauguration. So not a very easy transfer of power, you know, similar to our last president as well. So, um, but then they began a letter writing campaign and the two died on this very same day within hours of one another, 50 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed. So 50 years after on July 4th, they both died, both Thomas Jefferson and John Adams being famous friends. So he died in, uh, on July 4th. 1826, 50 years after the Declaration of Independence was signed. That's the last thing I said there. He sent Lewis and Clark on their expedition. And in fact, not only did he send them on the expedition, but those um, first remnants from the Lewis and Clark expedition became part of our very first Library of Congress. No, 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 not, not Library of Congress. That was um, Jefferson's own library. So Jefferson had library and he needed to, or he needed to get money to pay off the debt from his, his wife and his wife's family. And so he needed to make money. So he sold his own personal library to the federal government, which started the Library of Congress. Lewis and Clark expedition, those remnants that they brought back. So all of the collections that they brought back were some of the beginnings of the Smithsonian Institution. So look at the way that, um, uh, look at the legacy that Thomas Jefferson has left us with the University of Virginia, with the Smithsonian Institute. He was the first person to live in the White House for his entire term. He gave us a li library, but he didn't give us the White House. Uh, he thought it was a little bit eccentric. Um, and he gave us the Library of Congress. He gave us the Louisiana Purchase. Oh my gosh, he was an amazing president, an amazing president. Okay, um, I said his vice president, Aaron Burr, resigned and, and that, that gave me the idea to make sure that I brought up all the facts about uh, what was going on there. Uh, his face is on Mount Rushmore. He started the Library of Congress and I think I covered pretty much everything that I wanted to cover. Let's look at some of the pictures, some more of these pictures. <clears throat> so here we've got the left, Lewis and Clark expedition on Columbia, on the Columbia by Harold von Schmidt. They explored the far Northwest to the mouth of the Columbia River, 1804 to 1806. So that's what my hand is covering there, that picture right there, down at the bottom there the Lewis and Clark expedition. And then this one here at the top, an English cartoon on the Embargo Act showing Napoleon prompting Jefferson. The unpopular embargo was later repealed. So we used to have, especially in the New Yorker, all kinds of cartoonists, which was a way for people to make their political statements about the government in ways that weren't so harsh, right? And that's part of what the Alien and Sedition Act wouldn't allow, right? Some of those cartoonists to be able to say what they wanted to say. Or maybe that's how they started the cartoons, right? Was because they couldn't say it out loud because of the Alien and Sedition Act. So they would say it in a, in a funny roundabout way. Right? I can't read this word right here. The happy effects of the grand system of shutting 
quartz. I don't know. I can't read that. English. So, so they're debating it, and it's Napoleon, obviously, that's pleading to Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson must be giving in or something like that. I don't know. Okay. So, oh, and what did we have here? The official proclamation of the Louisiana Purchase. So this is the official proclamation. Look at that. Isn't this book amazing? The official proclamation proclaiming that we have purchased that land. It's in French. Very cool. Now, where are we? 1014. I really have a hard time going on a little bit longer because I have to get on with the critical thinking classroom in 15. So what I'm going to do is, as you can see, what I have here is, as you can't see because it's on my lap, not in the camera, as you can see, I have the book on speeches here. And so this, these are not the 501 speeches there. Declaration of Independence was a pretty good chunk of it. But these speeches actually have much, much more of the speech there. So here is the speech. It's the inaugural, inaugural address from Thomas Jefferson. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. So look at that. See how he changed? He would have said we are all Republicans. We are all states people. His speech says we are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. And so you can see here, this is a background on Thomas Jefferson. So, so I already read the biography and I read it from the other book. So I liked that a little bit better. It wasn't so dry. But as you can see, I've got some, some, um, some of his words highlighted here. And those are the things I want to start with tomorrow. We'll get into his wife. And then what I'm going to read for, not tomorrow, on Tuesday. And then what are we going to do next? <clears throat> on Tuesday, we're going to read the Transcontinental Railroad. And why am I reading that by Barbara Keeler? I'm reading this because we talked about California. I said I was going to read it. This was part of the 100, over 100, 100 books that I got from our local library for $40, right? And um, and because we, I heard about it and was so interested in the building of the railroad from that story of California, I wanted to read it. And this is timely because we're, we're talking about it right around the same time. Jefferson was 1809. In 1803, France, so we got Louisiana Purchase here. I don't know. Maybe we won't. We'll see. Building the Transcontinental Railroad was secured by Lincoln's support and the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862. We probably won't read this until we get closer to Lincoln. But we've got so much to read about uh, Lincoln and to do with Lincoln because we've got the Civil War to do with Lincoln. So I'm, I'm going to decide if I'm going to read this or not. I was just so intrigued after we read the story of, of California. We also have to do our segment on, on slavery, so I might start the segment on slavery, but I'm actually thinking maybe I'm going to start it the week after, not next week. I think I'm going to do maybe more presidents next week, get some presidents out of the way, and then the following week maybe we'll talk about slavery before we get into Lincoln. Okay, that's all that I have. This is Dr. Annette Farovich, and you are sitting here with me in the classroom. This is the Bookless Classroom. Why are we here? Because I'm the teacher and we need this. This is what we need. Thanks for being here. I will see you in 15 for critical thinking. What are we doing in critical thinking today? Let's look. Oh, so we were talking about personality, right? We were talking about the personality, the different personality types. Personality type A, type B, type C, and type D, right? So we were talking about the personality types. Now we're going to talk about personality and health, a little bit more about health. Okay, so I will see you in a few, and i got to get moving. Uh, I might be on a little bit late. Are you 